Chapter 3 A Disaster One glorious afternoon at the end of July, Miriam said she should like to take Baby to see a friend who lived in the town. Mrs Hopkins could go with her to carry the little one, and as it was a half-holiday, Dorothy might accompany them. It was a tram ride into Stapleford from the suburb where the Carstairs lived, and this added greatly to the pleasure of the trip. There always seemed something so merry about the smart yellow car with its glossy brown horses and tinkling bells. Another attraction was the gay town shops, the smart drapers, all ribbons and lace, the toy shop where were displayed the loveliest wax dolls and the most fairy-like furnishings for miniature housekeeping, the booksellers all glittering with cloth gilt, and the fancy shops that dazzled one with their show of pretty things in rich velvet, shining metal and rainbow glass. But none was more constantly fascinating to Dotty than the large bootmakers at the corner of Sun Street. It was not the shoes, however, or even the satin slippers that drew an almost continual group of young folks around this window, but a wonderful little working model of a cobbler and his boy, which was there exhibited. It was made of cardboard neatly coloured and moved by clockwork. Dorothy had seen it more than once already, but was never tired of watching the performance. The little cobbler, old and spectacled, and with a very red nose, sat at his stall, and a saucy-looking young apprentice at his side. The old man's arms flitted back and forth busily as he stitched the shoe upon his knee, but his big round eyes rolling up and down with the same movement showed more of the lids at each turn. Presently the little arms would move more slowly and still more slowly, the eyelids wholly drop and the cobbler appear motionless in sleep. Then the apprentice, who had been all the while industriously hammering, would stop, raise his head, and nod three times. Next, by a succession of jerky movements, he would lift his foot until his toe tipped up the cobbler's board, which, touching the old man's hand, would make it wake him up with a start. Instantly the boy would be zealously hammering again, the master would be sewing with the renewed energy, and after the lapse of a minute or so, all the antics would be gone through again. Dorothy felt as though she could stand and watch this little cobbler all day, and it was always a matter of great difficulty to get her past the shops. On the present occasion, however, though she knew very well that in alighting from the car, the large bootmakers would lie on the way to their destination, she never thought of it until Sun Street, with the usual knot of juveniles gathered at the corner, came in sight. She had been wondering for several minutes whether it would be possible to coax Miriam to let her carry that dear baby a little way. Fancy having that magnificent array of lace and embroidery spread out over her arms. But she hardly dared to think of it. Oh, there's the little cobbler, she suddenly exclaimed, finding herself close to the spot about mentioned. Oh, Mrs Hopkins, do stop and let baby look. He won't understand that yet a while, my dear, answered the nurse with a good-humoured laugh. He's not old enough, bless him. You must wait a few years, Miss Dorothy. Perhaps it won't be here, then, said Dotty, and left her sister's side to take another peep at the clockwork toy. We have not time to stop and watch. That today, said Miriam. I want to catch Mrs Thomas before she goes out. She's almost sure to do so on such a fine afternoon. Come along, Dotty. Now, although this was certainly an injunction against lingering, it was uttered in a half-careless tone that took a good deal from its weight. Dorothy would never have disregarded any serious expression wish of one in authority over her, but in the present case her sister and Mrs Hopkins walked on as if comparatively indifferent to her loitering behind a few minutes, and Dotty knew that she could soon catch up with them again. So she stood and watched the end of the performance and waited to see it begin again and laughed at the saucy apprentice boy's trick with renewed relish, and when she at length reluctantly turned away, she was quite surprised to see that her friends had already passed the next turning, which was called Bellman Lane. Before crossing that street, Miriam looked back and beckoned her. Then they walked on again, and Dorothy ran after them without pausing in her haste to see if anything was coming. She attempted to cross Bellman Lane at the very moment that a horse-breaker's drag was turning the corner from the high street. The pair of powerful young animals in process of training by means of this vehicle were too much for the men behind to pull up in time. 
Dorothy heard a fearful clatter of wheels and hoofs mingled with women's screams and the wild shouts of boys and men. She saw the open mouths and great yellow teeth of a horse close to her head. Then someone dragged her out of the way and let her go, so that in her confusion she stumbled and fell. Half stunned with mingled pain and fright, for one elbow was badly hurt, Dorothy scrambled to her feet, but although by this time quite a crowd had collected, no one seemed to take any notice of her. The horse kicked her, she heard one woman say. It got wild, you know, being pulled up so sudden. She saved the child, though, said another. In a second she'd have been under the wheels. Children are so thoughtless. Right on her temple, chimed in a man's voice. Couldn't be struck in a worse place. She looked like death when they got her away. Are you hurt, my dear? asked an old gentleman in a kindly voice. Dorothy was standing stupefied with horror and trembling from head to foot. Was she the child spoken of, and had somebody been injured in trying to save her? I... I don't know, she stammered. Who is it? What's happened? A lady saw that you were in danger of being run over and rushed to the rescue, but it is feared that she herself has been hurt by one of the horses. Where is she? asked Dorothy, between her chattering teeth. They have taken her into the chemist's shop over the way. See, where the people are crowding about the door and the policeman is trying to keep them back. Here's the little girl, said someone behind them. She's safe enough. The tone of the speaker suggested that if the cause of the disaster had not been quite so safe, it might have only served her right for her hidlessness. Turning round, Dorothy found herself close to Mrs Hopkins, who still carried the baby. Her usual florid face was ashy pale. Oh, my dear, was all the nurse could say. Where's Miriam? asked Dotty eagerly. Oh, my dear, I hope she'll get over it. She saved your life. They've took her into Reynolds, and the first words she said were, were, Is she hurt? Was it Miriam? Miriam that the horse is kicked, questioned Dotty, as the terrible truth dawned upon her. Yes, my dear. She just looked back after you again in time to see you in the way of that drag. She's a heroine if ever a woman was. I only pray that for this dear blessed baby's sake she mayn't have lost her own precious life. A dreadful feeling came over poor little Dorothy, while the nurse was speaking, a darkness and a dizziness with a sick sensation in her heart. When next she knew anything, she was sitting on a chair in the chemist shop. The July sunshine was blazing in the blue and amber jars in the window. Its light was blinding, and the smell of soaps and scents and aromatics seemed to make the air too thick to breathe. Open the door, someone said and a whiff of reviving coolness together with outside cheerful sounds and the jingle of tramway bells came in. Two or three boys also appeared curiously around the entrance. That's her, one of them said, and then Dotty remembered all. Where's Miriam? she asked, looking giddily around. And baby and nurse? The cry of an infant was at that moment heard from the inner room. I'm here, my dear, said Mrs Hopkins, coming into the shop. When you are better, we'll get in a car and go home. Is Miriam better? Is she coming too? She will go home in a cab with Mr Carstairs, answered Nurse, and her voice seemed shaky and strange. Oh, those dazzling jars, how could they look so gay? Those bottles of perfume with sparkling tops and all the dainty toilet things that Dotty used to think made Reynolds the nicest shop in the town. Would she ever look at them again without the horror of that moment coming back? Did you send for him? she gasped realising more readily than some children might the import of this fact. It was not very far, said Nurse, and we thought he ought to know. If you think you can walk to the tramway now, my dear, we had better go. 